Welcome to Elevate, the podcast where we dissect exceptional achievers who are consistently raising the bar personally and professionally to produce extraordinary results in investment real estate and ultimately in their lives. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here, and I'm blessed and grateful to be with Charlie Dobins. Charles, Charlie, how are you, sir? Good, Tyler. How are you doing, man? Doing fantastic. Doing fantastic. Having a lot of fun today. And uh, you know what? We've got some crazy things happening in the world, but we are still plugging it in and uh, having a good time. And uh, so looking forward to having a great conversation with you today. But with that said, I want to welcome Elevate Nation back to the show because it's time to take it to another level. Our mission is to identify and apply how the best of the best raise the bar personally and professionally to achieve greatness in real estate and beyond. This is where you learn the mindset, the habits, the routines, systems, tools, the strategies, and so much more from those who are elevating to a life without limits so you can do the same or even more for yourself. And this is a masterclass for leaders and those looking to achieve uncommon results and purposeful outcomes through real estate investing and ultimately in their lives. And with that said, if you enjoy the show, please you know hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, give us a review, a rating, a five-star review would certainly be helpful. Our goal is to reach millions and millions of people with this message because you know what? You have the opportunity to achieve fulfillment through real estate investing, as well as personal growth and constant never-ending improvement. And with that said, I want to welcome Charlie to the show. Charlie Dobins is a multifamily investor, attorney, and mentor to multifamily investors all around the country. Charlie founded Multifamily Investing Academy where he works with students in his owner forum program to train them in the correct way to acquire, operate, and own multifamily property. His legal and consulting practice has one specialty, helping investors overcome any lack of confidence in moving towards their financial objective of owning and operating apartments. Charlie is uniquely qualified to walk investors confidently through the entire process, analyzing property, negotiating contracts, organizing funding as well as transitioning to ownership and he's also a principal at Dobin's Law and a founder of the Multifamily Investing Academy so with that said Charlie welcome to the show tell us a little bit more about you behind the Tyler, box. well at least now we all know you know how to read I can do it I got it I got it <laughs> and let me just tell you I'm checking out your podcast here I'm looking at all the all the past guests you've had on I mean you've had you've had some uh, it's like a who's who in uh, multifamily um, you know, you got right. Paul Moore. I had a great conversation with Paul Moore. What great a guy. great guy. He's got a great, I, I, I had so much fun with him. Then you got the likes of the Dan Hanfords, the Gene Trowbridges, the Jake's, uh, the Jake and Geno's. Oh my gosh. Those are my boys, man. Come oh. on. All right. Well, you know what, then this is going to be a very easy conversation because uh, if, if you're, if you think you had to raise the bar and listen, I am the bar though. All those guys have to overcome. So let's, yeah. And you can tell Jake and Gino, I said that because awesome. I've had, I've been on their show and they've been on my show and it's, they're great guys. I love them. I yeah. love them. Good guys. So you're in good hands. Um, all right. So, so uh, yeah, the, you know, this is multifamily is my, is my jam. And let me tell you something that uh, I'm, I'm going to lay it out here first. I'm gonna, you know, you're going to, you're going to probably be one of the first ones to hear it. Now I teach people how to buy apartment complexes. So I teach them how to buy and do it the right way. And as an attorney, I protect them every step of the way to make sure they do it right. I'm in the process right now. We're selling one of our complexes. We have one more complex to go. Uh, and now I am transitioning my entire business, Tyler, to building apartments. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because like like anywhere, uh, you know, we are um, this market's a very very strong one, and the reason why this market is so incredibly strong is because the demand for our product has never been stronger. Because of social demographics that are going on, the demand for units, for apartments, for for uh, um, you know what we have to sell, which is a lease. Uh, has never been stronger. And, you know, I'm telling you, uh, right now I'm looking to build my old home uh, turf of uh, southern New Hampshire, just north of the Massachusetts border. And I got to tell you, the, uh, the demand here, every workforce housing unit is occupied. Over the nine communities from Nashua, New Hampshire, my town, all the way to the coast, Seabrook, New Hampshire, it, there's a waiting list to get in. So that tells you 
that we've got to move on to the next step, which is to is to start building. And that's that's where I'm taking it. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. I made an offer on some land yesterday. I've, I've just uh, you know found uh, another parcel right now, and I'm just right now I am just sourcing land the same way I sourced multifamily property for years. So, so talk to me about obviously you know one week ago. All right, we're sitting here. It is wednesday march 18th 2020 one week ago i would have totally said absolutely you know demand is crazy and and i i think that's the same today but how do you react with this crazy virus situation that's totally just decimating the economy as we speak uh you know i would agree that i think multifamily is where you want to be but then obviously there's so much uncertainty there how are the tenants going to pay their rent everybody's asking me this question so what what do you say about that yeah no listen I was on the phone with a client of mine this morning. We're trying to figure out exactly uh, what we need to do. He's trying to go into contract on a deal. And he says, Charlie, what do you think? I, I said, I, I said, I, I don't know what to tell you. I've never seen anything like this before. Yeah. And I can't with all confidence tell you to go under contract. And if, if uh, you know, if we didn't go under contract, uh, or if we did, what we need to do is really extend these uh, uh, period, time periods to not just maybe three months, maybe six months, you know, and, but also you have to make sure that, uh, that your uh, purchase and sale contracts have uh, two types of provisions in there. Um, force majeure contracts, which is, you know, French for superior force. Um, and then they also have to have a material adverse effect uh, provision within it as well, which are, which in many circumstances can be construed as the same thing, uh, you know. But here's the problem: this is where people, uh, you know, think, "Oh, I've got one of those contracts in there, one of those provisions in there." Okay, fine, you do. So what? You know, that's what the one thing they teach you in law school is: whenever you come to a provision, you always ask yourself the question, "So what?" And so you've got these force majeure clauses in your contract that are supposed to get you out of a deal somehow in the event of, of you know, act of God or pandemics or what have you. But some of these contracts are written so loosely that they're intended to be wide enough to drive a Mack truck through. And let me just tell you, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. The, you know, everybody uses Delaware, you know, especially if you're using an LLC, we all refer back to Delaware law. Delaware just came up with a huge change in the law, but it's not totally decided yet. And what it is, is back in the old days, the old standard for these material adverse effect provisions or these force majeure provisions was so high that if one party tried to invoke it against another party, there was never any chance of them uh, of a court saying, yep, yep, it was an act of God. You get to walk away from this contract. But then all of a sudden came what's called the acorn case in Delaware. And it pretty much took that bar and brought it way down and said, you know what? It doesn't need to be a long-term impact. It could be a short thing that's going on. And as a result, you can walk away from the contract. But the problem is most people's contracts in most states laws haven't caught up yet to Delaware or the contracts are still written in the old form. So you've got to make sure that when you write a purchase and sale contract, when you say, when you, Hey, I've got a force majeure contract, you ask the question, so what? Well, that means that if I can't perform, if my bank is not going to close on the deal because all their employees are homesick, then I don't have to worry about the deadline of my financing contingency and I get to extend it. And that's why you have to put this type of wording in your contracts nowadays, all because of this coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And i tell you something, Tyler, a month ago, I didn't have this problem. A month right. ago, this, this, didn't, this didn't work. This was not an issue. A week ago, it wasn't an issue. Exactly. Now we've got to, we've got to start thinking about these things. So to, to your original point, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. You know, now's the time to start uh, putting the systems in place for your business. Uh, start putting, you know, building your business the right way so that when everything gets back to normal, you can turn it on and start to perform on everything. Yeah. No, I totally, yeah. No, I totally agree. I keep going. I mean, you were, you were finding deals, putting systems in place, but yeah. 
I mean, the biggest thing right now is how do we adapt? How do we best adapt? Because like you said, I mean, one week ago, you know, obviously I would agree. I mean, the demand is through the roof. The demographics make a ton of sense. And then you have this black swan event, this unprecedented, unpredictable type of an event. So what's your gut telling you in terms of the best way to adapt? I mean, obviously there's got to be a lot of information that we've still got to gather and come out of this thing, but what, what's your gut telling you right now? My gut is saying just sit and be patient. Mm -hmm. I know that that caused, because think about it, guys. Right now, I had to go down to a restaurant. Some, and I'm on a mailing list for some restaurants around here. And I went down to this restaurant to get takeout, a restaurant that I would never get takeout for. But the owner of the restaurant, I'm on his mailing list, says, hey, help my staff and come get takeout and you know uh, let it help us make it through this tough time like i love this restaurant i don't see this restaurant go south i'm going to go and get takeout from this restaurant just to help the employees because you know what all those employees pay rent to some landlord yeah and if we don't get that fixed if we don't help those people that landlord's going to be the one that's having the problems so you know from a lender standpoint i don't know how how banks are going to be able to lend without seeing what's going to happen to these tenants yeah. who, you know, go to, who can't go two to three months, uh, you know, without work to pay their rent. You know, right. It's just not going to happen. So that's the, that's the issue that we're seeing right now is um, it's, it's, it's sit and wait. You got to sit. Absolutely. Yeah. And every deal that I'm working on right now, it's like, we've got to extend the timelines. We've got to yeah. see how this shakes out, you know, and it seems like that's the answer across the board. But let me ask you this, Charlie, from a legal perspective, if you think of, you're thinking ahead towards, you know, what other sort of black swan events could occur in the future, because that's the way of the world. It's, it's so uncertain. So how do we deal with that from a legal perspective as real estate investors, you know, you mentioned uh, sort of clauses in, in terms of contracts, you know, now looking back a month, a month ago now, and it makes perfect sense. Of course we need those, but what other sort of uncertain or unpredictable events could we prepare ourselves for legally uh, in terms of just general structure? Okay. Well, first off, I mean, you're, you're asking me as if, as lawyers are fortune tellers and we know, but because no, no, right no. Now, I don't want you to fortune tell. I want you to tell me how can we prepare ourselves in the event of the uncertain? Okay. The easiest way to protect yourself is to think about those things that you have control over and those things that you have no control over. So when you put words into a contract as far as performance and part of your performance relies on a third party to do something. And if that third party doesn't act, there, you can't perform. That's where you've got to protect yourself. That's, that's the only place where, like you said, you don't need to be a fortune teller for this. But if you went in there and said, hey, um, I'm going to need a survey. I'm going to need title work done. I'm going to need uh, you know, the, the bank to approve this. And the bank's going to have a uh, require my third party reports, which is going to include not only the survey, but an engineering report. Okay, great. Well, guess what? The engineer is not allowed to go into all the units. Uh, the property manager just sent out an, a text or an email or a, a posted on everyone's door that says they will not be doing any repairs and maintenance on the units because all they're doing is emergencies. How are you going to perform your due diligence? How are you going to go through every single unit? How are you going to come up with a survey to get to the title company? Oh, that doesn't matter because the title company is not working anyway. You know, these are all third parties that you have no control over. So what you have to do is put provisions in your contract that says, hey, I can only control what I can control. If any of these people cannot perform the contract because of these material adverse effects or because of a force majeure incident, then I get to get out of the contract. I get my earnest money back regardless of where we are in the process. Or, you know, you can write it a little bit uh, oh, yeah, less, more leniently where you say like, we're going to extend the, the periods another 30 days and then we're going to revisit it. And if after another 30 days, nothing's going on, I get my money back. I get to walk no penalties. Yeah. So those are the only things that you can do is, is control what you can control and, and, and indemnify uh, those that you can't. Yeah, no, I mean, this whole situation, you know, playing out is just absolutely fascinating. And, you know, it's just like, it, it just reminds us that we don't know what's next. I mean, I, I was just at a conference last uh, you know, a month ago, we were talking about, you know, it looks like we've got another five to seven years of, of a growth economy. And, you know, that that has nothing to do with the un, 
you know, unpredictable, you know, so it's just, it's just fascinating. And, yeah. uh, it also reminds me as investors, how much we have to train ourselves to not get emotional in these type of times, you know, how do we not just overreact? I mean, how do you, how do you train yourself in times of, I guess, you know, peace for the war time to, uh, to operate effectively yourself, Charles? Yeah. Oh, it's impossible. You can't tell. You just can't. I mean, I mean, Tyler, I, I mean, we can sit here and just look at each other, come up with some, some cockamamie, you know, schemes and stuff, but there's no possible way that we can foresee everything. I mean, this is a, another 9-11. This is another, yeah. I mean, you're, you're a young guy. I don't know where you were in 9-11, but. Oh, I remember old? exactly where I was. I was in school at the time. And yeah. And I, what, what yeah. like, how old were you? Yeah, I was in eighth grade. In eighth grade. Yeah. 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 I had, at that time I was running an insurance company with, you know, 35 employees and all of a sudden the world changed mm -hmm. and everything changed as a result. And it took, you know, at that point it, you know, the dust settled a lot faster, uh, you know, figuratively speaking, than yeah. I think it's going to settle in this case. And, uh, you know, we just don't, we, we cannot predict uh, what's going to happen because you know what, what happens if there's another one right behind it? Right. Then, you know, then we're all, we're all screwed. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, the reason why this show is so focused on real estate investing, but then also personal growth is because in these type of times, it's like, how do we train ourselves when the sun was shining to be able to prepare ourselves to act and operate most efficiently and most optimally? So, so tell me about, I want to know more about you, Charlie, you know, t tell me about, you know, you obviously are doing big things. You have a lot of influ influence in the space. You've helped a lot of people. You've built a significant portfolio yourself with over 800 units. And then I know that's continually growing. You're talking about how you're expanding sort of into more development. And, and so many clients are doing big things, I know personally. Um, so talk to me. Was there a moment in your life when you kind of drew a line in the sand and said, look, I'm going to be extraordinary. I'm going to do anything it takes to be more than just an ordinary individual? Yeah, I can tell you there, there are two two events, two times that I can think of. First off, one time when I was uh, younger, just out of college, and I was I, at the time I was selling insurance for New York Life Insurance, and and I went and I I had to give my biography at the Nashville Rotary Club, and and I you know throw, threw in a couple of jokes, told a few jokes, and at the end of the event, Sam Tamposi, my hero, the guy was the largest landowner in New Hampshire. He was a he was part owner of the Red Sox huge huge a legend in the industry but one of the nicest guys he came up to me afterwards and said charlie you're going to be a success and i thought i thought wow that's really cool but at the same time i thought to myself yeah but it's not going to be in the insurance business i hate the insurance business <laughs> i want to get out of the insurance business this is not this is not meant for me and then you know fast forward and went to law school got out of law school and went back in the insurance business because I was making a lot of money at, it, at the time. Uh, and then um, when I turned 40, the second time, the second event that occurred was I, I turned 40 and I took stock of my life and I did not like what I saw. And, uh, you know, here I was, the owner of the company. And, you know, many times some of my employees made more money than I did, uh, you know, in that pay cycle. And, uh, you know, there were times when I, uh, there I am working seven day weeks and six, you know, 12 hours, 16 hour days. And I am absolutely miserable. Mm. I hate what I do. I hate where I'm going. And I, 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 I can't do this for another 25 years. And, you know, that was when I turned 40 and I said, to, to my wife, I, I don't want to live this way. I, I, I just, this is not what life is meant to be. It's when I finally took that, took stock and said, this can't be it. There's got to be more to it. I mean, I remember 15, 20 years ago, Sam Tamposi told me I was going to be a success. You know, when's that going to happen? And, you know, sure enough, it, uh, it took that type of burning the bridges, burning the ships, where I finally said, I'm out. I'm doing what I want to do. And I always wanted to own apartments. I always want to be that guy. And that's when I went out there and, and, uh, and sold the insurance business never looked back uh, and just started buying apartments and, and loved it ever since. And, you know, that's, that's how I started, you know, uh, consulting uh, and, and uh, coaching to people, telling them how to do it the right way because I saw so many of these gurus out there just, just, you know, they didn't even know what they were doing and they're out there teaching people how to buy apartments. It's scary. It was scary. So that's, that's the other part. And I absolutely love that aspect of my, of my business as well, which is so much fun. 
No, that's awesome. And it's interesting yeah. how the, uh, the belief in you from someone else, just from a visceral perspective, sort of, you know, germinated, you know, so many years later, and then you cause you to really sort of say, taking that inventory and say, man, this is not what it's all about. You know, oh. I just see so many people that, you know, achieve some form of success, you know, quote unquote, that others would say are successful. But if you're miserable, you need to take that step back and draw that line in the sand and say, look, this is, it's not worth it because look, our life is too short to, to yeah. live in misery. But, uh, I love the fact that you transition into multifamily. And one thing that I know about you is that you say multifamily is the best business to be in. And so why, why, do, why do you believe that is the case? Oh my gosh, so many reasons. This is where millionaires are made. This is, you know, people, you don't make millions flipping houses. And if you go back, and I love it, whenever I'm listening to my Pandora and, I, and uh, Fan Merrill comes on and he's like, hey, I'm coming to your town and I'm going to show you my three principles for how you can be successful. There. And he says, for buying and flipping houses, for you know, uh, making more money. And then he always throws in the third thing, which is so that you can own, a multi, you can own cash flowing properties. And I'm like, Fan, that's what I do. Like, why do you have to do the fix and flips? Cause that's his back. That's how he got started. Like, why do you have to do that? And uh, you know, now um, you know, you're just, you're just trying to trying to teach people what I've been teaching them for years. And, and that's because even for a guy like fan realizes that multifamily is the way to go. And I teach it in my classes. I teach what's called the power of the cap rate. And it's the cap rate that makes millions. That's what makes people uh, multimillionaires is understanding that simple formula for valuing multifamily property. It's just, it's the way to go. It's absolutely, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can't ask for anything other than that. It's, it's no, no other businesses like that. I, I liken when I, when I do my comparison and I so show people the five ways you make money in the multifamily business compared to owning a subway franchise. There's no comparison. Multifamily is the only business that pays you five different ways when you, when you uh, buy a property. You'll never get, the only way you make money in, in a subway franchise is if you can sell that sub for a profit. And otherwise, you're not making a dime. But a multifamily, there are just so many ways to make it. It's beautiful. It's so like talk nothing. to me. Talk to me about uh, what are your five ways? I mean, we're, th we're talking about appreciation, depreciation, leverage, cash flow. What else? What are we? Okay. What are, um, yeah. um, property management. Property management. Got okay. it. Yep. So appreciation. Yep. Okay. But that's only realized when you sell the property. Yep. And the way we get appreciation in our business is we drive the NOI. And that increase in of, a, in a, of a dollar in the NOI is, is ca extrapolated on by the, by the cap rate. So, you know, you make a dollar in, um, you make a dollar more on a four cap property, your person, your family's net worth has increased by $25. Yep. So that's why we drive the NOI there. So that's the appreciation. Then we've got the, the cash flow or the profit. You're not always going to have that, but that's another way that we make money. Uh, then we've got the, um, uh, the mortgage pay down which is, you know, you talk about the leverage. That's where you've got 100 people in your property paying down your note to the bank every single month. So that at the end of 20 years or the term, whatever it is, you didn't pay a dime and now you own that property free and clear because you had 100 other people uh, paying for it. Then you get the property management. That is gold. And that's what I teach people. It's like, listen, every successful property owner that I've ever met owns their own property management company. They control that. That money comes into you every single month, guaranteed. That's how you're gonna quit your job, pay your mortgage, put your kids through school, is because of that tuition, uh, because of that, that property management money. All the other things are gravy when you sell the property. Uh, cash, the cash flow and the property management come into you hopefully every single month. The other three aspects is what, are, is what you're gonna receive when you sell the property. And then the, uh, so what, what, did, I, did I get them all, what did I do? I did cash flow. I think so. Property management, uh, mortgage pay down, appreciation. Oh, and then and then something else that we do, uh, uh, which is called the acquisition fee. If we syndicate the deal and we we put the deal together, then we should be paid for putting that deal together. And then that's that's called the uh, the acquisition fee or the and and yep. or the disposition fee. So those five ways are how you make money in multifamily. Yep. 
when you compare any one of those five ways to owning a Subway franchise, you can't do it. You just can't do it. And that's why millionaires get made in multifamily and not in any other business. Are you someone who is looking to seriously elevate your life this year? I mean, now, this year, 2020, because I want to let you know that I am currently opening up a few coaching spots for people like you who want to close the gap from where you are to where you want to be. And I want to invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. Again, that's coachwithtyler.com. I have to tell you, this is not for everyone. This is only for those who are defiantly committed, those who are decisive, those who are coachable, those who are resourceful. They're willing to do whatever it takes. They're willing to sacrifice time, energy, and invest resources into themselves to get to where they want to be, to live life at the highest level, and to elevate to a life without limits, exactly what we talked about on this show. If that is you, I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. Again, that's coachwithtyler.com. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot uh, to what you're talking about there and, and no investor left behind. I mean, what you first talked about is that a cap rate is really what makes multifamily real estate investors millionaires or multimillionaires. And really what he's talking about is, you know, a return on your, your cash. If you were to buy a property, all cash, it's a, if it's a five cap property, if it's a four cap property, whatever it may be, you know, if you were to buy a property for a million bucks, you're going to get returned, you know, 4% on that deal. If it's a 4% cap rate, but obviously leverage can amplify your return. And that's what we, another way that we really love multifamily is because of the favorable economics in terms of the financing opportunities there. Um, you know, but one thing you talked about there was, you know, owning your own property management company. I think that it is, uh, you know, such a unique sort of approach or sort, such a unique perspective to say that, you know, that's the fifth way to earn, you know, additional capital in multifamily. Is there a, you know, critical mass that you would suggest or number of units or assets under management before you would say that it makes sense to acquire or create your own property management company? Yeah, you know, I teach people, my, my program is called How to Own a Thousand Apartments in Five Years. And the way I teach it is you buy 20 units in the first year, and then you double what you own without selling anything every single year. So 20, next year you're gonna double it to 40, now you own 60, now you're gonna double that, that's 120 now, in the third year you own 180. So it's typically in about the second to third year is when you're going to have enough critical mass that you can quit your job. And this is something, it's all a formula, you can figure out exactly how much, you know, when, at what point you're going to be able to quit your job and just, uh, you know, become the, the property manager on these properties just based upon the average rents in the marketplace that you're buying it. Because once you know the average rents, then you can figure out what your property management fees should be in that marketplace. And that'll tell you what you'll be collecting. So you tell me like, well, how quickly can I quit my job and, and start doing this? Well, you tell me. You tell me what your rents are in that marketplace and you go figure it out and you tell me when you can quit your job. And that should be your goal. That should be your first goal is how many units do I need to achieve that, that objective right now? And that's the key. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing that you didn't talk as much about, but I'm sure is a part of your strategy is just all the tax benefits, right? You know, the yeah. IRS is, is subsidizing multifamily real estate investors to a, to a huge degree when it comes to depreciation, when it comes to interest, when it comes to the tax rate on the cash flow, all of these different things. I mean, talk about that. Oh, I mean, we can talk about different like ways you set up your LLC, whether you do it as an S corp, whether you do it as, as a pass through, uh, you know, the depreciation on the property, whether you take advantage of accelerated appreciation, depending upon where you're buying the property mm -hmm. or, you know, these, these opportunity zones. So, but here's my thing is I teach all of those things, but my point is this, you buy multifamily because it's a great investment. You don't do it because it's got a, a great tax benefits. That's oh, just gravy. You know, yeah. I call that the Willie Nelson school of, of, of investing, where, you know, you end up with an investment that, hey, guess what? The government changed the laws and all of a sudden it's not a great investment anymore. You buy multifamily because it is a, an incredibly sound, safe investment, hedge against inflation, and it comes with some phenomenal tax benefits. That's why you should be getting into, into multifamily. It's just, it's so yeah. beautiful. I mean, you just yeah. can't lose. You know, you we love, I've lost. Uh, let me take that back. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, definitely, I uh, definitely want to talk about that. But the other thing I just wanted to say is, um, I think it's great as well is that passive investors who invest in syndication opportunities also get these benefits, you know, from all of these different angles, including the tax benefits. So obviously, you don't want the tax tail to wag the dog, so to speak. But you know, with all of these things combined, it does create sort of a great opportunity, especially in a, in a completely uncertain global environment that we're in. Uh, so talk to me, you know, talk to me about those failures. I mean, what have you experienced uh, uh, along the way? Pick hey, up. listen, don't, you know, don't take any, anybody's advice who's, uh, who hasn't uh, been through a cycle yet. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a key. You've got to know, you have to have lived through this and, and, and lost your shirt, made money, lost money. I've done it. I've done it all. Uh, I, I, there's one guy out there, uh, one guru out there, I'll, I'll keep uh, calling on him because it just burns me up. And he talks about how, you know, you can always overpay for multifamily property because the prices never go down. Well, that guy must be 12 years old and he wasn't around for the last crash because I can guarantee you multifamily properties values can go down and not come back up. And, uh, you know, that's exactly what happened to me because I own property. You know, I bought property at the height of the market and those cap rates, uh, you know, start to grow and, you know, you can't, you can't come back and, um, uh, you know, uh, you have to come back with a lot of money to, 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 to close that gap, that leverage gap that the bank is looking to protect themselves for. Otherwise, they're going to call your note and you're out of luck. And that's, yeah. hey, that's happened to me. And, you know, that's just the name of the game. That's why I teach my students, you have to buy the property the right way. You're better off walking away from a deal that is, got, that is way too narrow because if the market changes, you're going to be in big trouble. Yeah. And, you know, another guru out there that tries to tell you that uh, all you need is 1.2 debt coverage ratio and then you're all set. That's, you know, that's because that's what the bank will let you get away with. Well, you know, you're not the bank. And the bank has got, you know, controls the collateral. You don't. And the bank controls all your personal collateral if you sign personally. So you got to be very careful when you look at these, um, at these deals. Uh, I tell my students that the, the debt coverage ratio is a dynamic number. And it changes based upon the quality of the asset. The riskier the asset, the higher your debt, cover, debt coverage number should be. As a matter of fact, um, we, uh, I call the debt coverage ratio my sleep number. The higher the number, the better I can sleep at night. Yeah. And that's the way you have to structure your deals. Otherwise, if this market changes, like look what happened, you know, in the last week. What's happened, yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and here we are. We're having to deal with it right now. So you just don't want to be that guy. So talk to me, you know, with, with that said, I mean, this is so fresh and it, you know, the market had been just growing, growing, growing for the past decade. And now all of a sudden this totally unprecedented event just happens. So how do you, how do you act in those times? Like, you know, two weeks ago, one week ago, you're looking at a deal and you're saying, you know what, five and a half cap, it seems to make sense. You know, it's a, maybe it's a B class property in a, in a solid and growing in a stable, you know, sub market, a metropolitan area, you know, call it Midwest or Southeast United States. I mean, how do you make those decisions and how do you mitigate those failures, uh, you know, in that type of environment with something that's so uncertain that just happened? Yeah, and the thing is, it's so uncertain. We, we've never seen anything like this before, so we don't know exactly how it's going to pan out. Ultimately, everything will go back to normal, but is it going to be three months? Is it going to be a year? Is it going to be two years? We don't know. So, you know, I'll tell you, uh, I, was, I was closing on a deal. I had, a, had 30 days to go before the close when Fannie Mae went belly up. I should have stopped right there and put the kibosh on the deal but I kept pushing through. And four or five years later, I was giving those keys back to the bank mm -hmm. because I bought at the height and it never came back. And, and you know, we couldn't do anything with that particular deal. That was a bad deal. And so that's why I tell my students, whoa down here, let's not go into contract just yet. Don't worry about losing the property. Somebody else is gonna go through the same exact issues right now. So let's just remain focused and realize that, that this is not the right time to put our name on the dotted line because it could all come back to, uh, come back to bite us. And that's that's my advice to to my students is like let's let's go slow here because you know I've been through this before and I and, and I don't want to see anybody else have to go through this type of thing again.
Yeah, no, I was just talking to a banker right before we got on the call. And, you know, they've had hundreds of calls in the past day or two about, you know, service, you know, borrowers who cannot service their debt. They're already saying that they can't service the debt. And so, you know, you're going to start to see foreclosures across the board and values are going to be dropping. I mean, it's, it is absolutely insane out there. So yeah. we've got yeah. to keep our cool, but, you know, also remain strategic, right. And see how this all plays out and how can we act in the marketplace. So, I mean, just think about it for a second. We've got this situation here, and you've always got to get back to who buys the soap. Uh, my mother's old saying, yeah, okay, that's fine, but who buys the soap? In our business, the tenants buy the soap. So you've got to ask yourself the question, what condition are our tenants in as a result of what's going on? Our customer base is in trouble right now. Mm -hmm. And you're actually seeing the government entities, those governors coming, say, telling, st telling landowners and, and, um, and landlords, don't foreclose on anybody. I mean, don't foreclose, but don't evict anybody. Don't evict That's anybody. Yeah. The tenants are hearing that and they're like, hey, nani, nani, we don't have to pay our rent. Yeah. But guess what? What is the guy not saying? What is the governor not saying? That my property taxes are, don't have to be paid. He's yeah. not saying that. He's still expecting me to pay my, my property tax. And the mortgage still wants, to, more, the bank still wants to get paid on their mortgage. So you got to take a step back and say, wait a minute, our tenants, our customers at this particular time are in a sorry state. And should we be taking on more customers or should we be protecting the customers that we, that we currently have? Yeah. And you know, I'll, I had this conversation with a guy today and he's like, oh, well, what happens if we, you know, I let these guys go on, off on the, on the rents and they don't have to pay. Like, listen, not so fast. They've got to pay. You've just got to structure something so that, that you get your money back at some point in the future. Otherwise, you know, these guys are going to be, you're going to have to evict them because you're going to get people in there who pay. Yeah. So it's a, you know, you've got to be very smart. Like you said, strategic and you got to be very smart about it. Well, it's another, it's another reason why we've got to let the dust settle on this too, because you also see from the other side, you know, that you've got some, some bills that have been proposed to sort of help tenants pay their rent, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. So it's like, how does this all shake out? I don't think any of us know, um, but we just wait and see and we're just yeah. patient. So yeah. talk to me, talk to me, Charlie, um, you know, with all this said, you know, not, not just the situation, but just in general, as you hone in your processes, as you raise the bar, I mean, what are you looking to sort of, you know, what, what is this opportunity giving you in terms of time to improve your own business? How are you using this? Yeah, well, right now I'm just prospecting, prospecting for deals. I mean, you know, it, it, this is a, I'd rather be on this side of the fence than on the other side. You know, I'd rather be out there looking for deals and seeing what's happening. And like you said, I mean, nothing has shaken out yet. Uh, so I want to get out there as much as I possibly can. I'm telling you, uh, you know, I took care of my clients all morning long. And this afternoon, I've just been going after deals. That's all I've been doing all afternoon. Yep. And, uh, you know, and just getting my face out there in front of as many brokers. Hey, I'm looking to buy. Hey, I'm looking to buy. I know what's going on, but, you know, let's, let's talk about it. Because these brokers are going to know who's in trouble and they're going to call me. So that's really what you got to be doing. I love it. I love it. So talk to me. How are you, have you been investing in yourself in addition to investing in the growth of, the, of your business as well as multifamily real estate? Oh, I tell you, I am, uh, you know, every single day I focus on my day. And, you know, I start off reading and I, I do audible.com. I mean, one book here that I wanted to share with you that actually Jake, no, was it Jake or Gino? It was Jake. I always get the two of them mixed up, you know, because they look so They're different. two in the same, man. They're, they're, oh, they're brothers. I love, I love those guys. Yeah. Yeah. But know. they told me about the book, Big Shifts Ahead. Ooh. Folks, I recommend that, that, you, uh, that you all read that book because that book is gold right now. Uh, you know, so I think it was Jake that recommended that book, but I'm, I'm constantly reading every single week. I'm, I've got a new book to go on and then also yeah. map out my day. And, you know, I, um, uh, there's a uh, guy, um, um, uh, Michael Hyatt. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know, him, but he's, yeah. uh, his thing is best year ever. Uh, when I first started with him, I went to his best year ever in January and guess what? I had my best year ever. So wow. now I'm, I, you know, I use his, um, I got his, uh, his mm -hmm. journal uh, focus planner and I go through this every day at the end of the week, I write down what happened the week before, what's going to happen coming up. And I'm, I'm very, very methodical in how I proceed on everything. If I'm not, I am 
I, I can't function. I have to be totally organized uh, at how I do it. You know, I got 150 clients. And uh, if I didn't have this type of order and structure, I'd, I'd, I'd go out of my mind. I, I, I would yeah. be crazy. But uh, I handle my businesses all very well and I enjoy myself. And, uh, you know, I set goals. I, uh, you know, a couple of years back, my goal was to, uh, was to um, uh, fly, was to be a pilot. And now, see if I can find, uh, you know, if people follow me around, they know that I'm, uh, they know that I'm, uh, uh, I always do this and on any time I'm talking, but there's my baby. Beautiful. Isn't that cool? Red, white, and blue. I love it. Yep. Yep. They call me Miss, I call it Miss America. I get out of it with my Captain America outfit on and the cape and everything. Woo! That's awesome. Step out. Yeah. So it's, uh, that's my jam. That's my fun is to go flying. And, um, and I, yeah, I flew down, I live up here in the Boston area and I flew down to Manassas, Virginia last weekend to pick up my son. Uh, so it's just, it's a, you know, you gotta have those goals. You gotta have those types of, of, um, you know, things to look forward to. Uh, my goal now is to break ground for land, uh, break gr ground for my first apartment building in the next, uh, you know, by the end of the summer, that's my goal. And, that's uh, awesome. yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be that's fun. That's awesome. So you're feeding your mind, you're reading, you're, <laughs> you know, you're continuing to prospect, you're continuing to build business, you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're building goals outside of just business as well. I mean, what other type of goals do you set? I mean, are you setting, you know, all right, I'm, I'm looking to develop my first apartment complex. I'm looking to fly. Do you set goals for your health, for your relationships as well? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Especially my, my health. You know, I'm, I'm 72 years old. and uh, Wow, you, you know, look amazing. You look yeah. amazing. Seriously, I'm not trying to hit on you or anything, but you look no, great. I for 72, well, I'm actually 55, but nobody says I look good for 55. <laughs> I, I have to tell you I'm 72. Actually, you look terrible. We're going to have to end this here. Sorry about that. See, see what I tell you. See, this is why I need these goals. Otherwise, I look like hell. You know, but I, you know, I take all my pills. I, I go to the Y every morning, even though now it's closed. I know, mine too. Oh, oh my horrible. gosh. What Worst. is going on? Dude, it's the worst. You know, so I got all the I got all the apps on my phone for like working out and stuff like. But bah, it's just not the same. I agree. The same. Um, yeah, but I, you know, I I I do things. You know, now with like for instance, I'm I'm gonna go f uh, fly my son and myself up to um up to uh, Nova Scotia to play golf. That's mm -hmm. one of my goals. Uh, that that's uh, you know those types of things. I'll fly down to to Kiowa Island and, and stay down oh, there. That's cool. I want to go uh, live in Ireland for a month and, and just run my business and nobody knows where I am, but I'll be in Ireland and just enjoy myself. So that's uh, the, the, the beautiful thing about this business is that you can do it anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, um, and so why not, why not take advantage of that uh, and, and make it happen? All right, Tamara Aragon, uh, I, I interviewed her the other day. She's got a, uh, an event. Oh boy. I don't know if she's going to be having it now uh, in Ireland. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, I was going to go over to that and, and maybe extend it out for a couple of weeks and get one of these, uh, VRBOs or Airbnbs and stay for a month and, uh, just, just live life. Just yeah. Live. That's what it's all about, man. Real yeah. estate is a vehicle towards living that life, man. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Talk to me, you know, in the midst of all this, um, you know, as you continue to just adapt and, and grow and, and pivot. I mean, what are you getting 1% better on daily, would you say, right now? Oh, jeez. That's a tough one, I know. Uh, no, I'd say focus. 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 I think my focus is becoming more clear uh, the older I get. as you know, Because I, I, honestly, you think about how much time you get left. Yeah. And you think, okay, well, I got I to gotta really, I don't have time to mess around with this stuff. You know, one thing that I've stopped doing over the last couple of years, and I'll tell you why, is I just don't watch the news the way I used to. I just mm. don't get wrapped up in the politics. I just don't, it's just, hey, and, and a lot of it has to do with my father, who was my hero. My father would walk into the office on the Wednesday after a national election, the Tuesday of a national election. He'd walk into the office and you know what he'd say? He'd look at everybody and say, so who won? <laughs> and now, you know, what he's telling everyone is, it doesn't matter who won. Yeah. Your life is still going to go on. You're going to still, you know, live your life and live your dreams. Who cares what goes on in Washington? Just live your life. And, uh, you know, that is definitely one thing that I've changed over the last couple of years. I've just, you know, remained more focused on, on my objectives and my goals. And it's a lot more fun. Totally. 
Yeah, I totally agree, man. I have watched more news this past week than I have in the past four or five years plus, and it's it's destroying my mind. I can I feel know, it. That's what everybody is telling me. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's crazy. Got to get away. Yeah. No, I totally agree. That's another reason why I love the podcast is because we can spread this message. We can spread yeah, the good stuff. It's you know. Fun. It's yeah. Fun. So, Charlie, what's the driving force behind what you do? Um, really just to help other people. I mean, cause I look at it as like, I don't, most of the stuff I don't do for myself, my plan is it. Uh, but you know, I want to make sure my kids are taken care of. I'm getting involved in, in an organization at my, at my high school that I, you know, graduated from. And, uh, you know, where we're helping the, uh, some underprivileged kids get tuitions to go to, um, go to the school. We're looking to do that for 20 kids. Um, you know, there are just so many other things that I'm trying to get more involved in as I, as my business takes off and as I have more, more uh, control over my life because I can't. So, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking to do. That's, that's, that's my focus. That's awesome, man. I love real estate because of that, and especially multifamily real estate, because we can help people. We can help the investors. We can help the people who work on the properties. We can help the tenants. We can help so many people who service, you know, the acquisition, the operation of these properties. So, man, I totally respect that. And uh, I want to I want to transition into our rapid fire section. We call it the <laughs> rare air questionnaire. We're going to continue to push and scale the limits, man. We're going to continue to raise the bar and go beyond what anyone else thought was possible. And so you know, I, tell, thought, I, I may not join you for that trip, but let's give it a try. Okay. Let's see how we do. That's right. I figured you would be kind of lazy on this one, man. I could just see it. Yeah. Like, you know, I'll, I'll be like, uh, I'll be like Albert Einstein on this one. Okay. Okay. Uh, With the tongue know, out. Albert yeah. Einstein had a, um, had a, had a chauffeur who looked just like him. And, uh, you know, the guy was sitting in the back of the room and, and, and uh, listen to Albert Einstein give his speech. And so finally, the chauffeur said to Albert Einstein, I was, you know what? I know your speech so well, I can give it. That's so Albert awesome. Einstein said, you know what? Next time, you give it, and I'll sit in the back of the room. So he does, and he sits in the, gets up there, and he gives the whole talk about theoretical physics, nails it all right down to the end, and then he opens it up for questions. And some PhD candidate theoretical physicist raises his hand and asks him some amazingly esoteric question that only Einstein would know the answer to. And the chauffeur looks at the guy and he says, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard. Let me know how stupid that question is. That question is so stupid. I'm going to have my chauffeur in the back of the room answer that question for you. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's so, awesome. I'm not heard All right, that go one. ahead. Lay, lay it on me. Well, you know what? I'm going to make it easy on you. And I will, <laughs> I will tell you that what this is all about is working smarter, not harder. So maybe I can reel you back in here so you all can right, put yourself – not your show for here. I love it. I love it. So talk to me. We talked about a few books earlier, Big Shifts Ahead, which I'm definitely going to be uh, yeah. putting in the Amazon cart here right after the show. Best year ever. Also things we've talked about with Michael Hyatt. But what are two or three of the most impactful books that you've read and, and why? Okay. Uh, one of them is Profit First. Uh, two books. Uh, okay. First off, the one that des two books that designed my consulting business were both written by um, uh, Seth Godin. Mm. And the first one is Purple Cow. And I didn't want to have a guru coaching program like everybody else's. So I created a Purple Cow. Then as time went on, I read uh, Seth Godin's other book called Tribe. And I wanted to create a sense of tribe among all of my students, of all my clients, where we are all part of a big group and work together towards getting our deals done. And so mm -hmm. those two books, uh, Purple Cow and Tribe by Seth Godin, were really what, what uh, got me thinking uh, about what, how I can do th these things differently. And then there's another guy, and his name is uh, Michael uh, Michalowicz, uh, and he wrote Profit First. And that has a lot to do with money management and making sure that, that you are paying yourself first or taking profit out of your company uh, before you pay everybody else. And that is key to everything. My, you know, all the money that comes in every month, I make sure I profit first over everything else. And that is, it helps you keep a clearer perspective on what it is that your business is there for. It's not there just to get up and go to, go to work every day. It's to pay yourself first and then take care of everything else after that. So those are those, I, I just gave you three good ones. Um, yeah. yeah, those are, uh, 
Yeah, those are my most fun books. So. That's awesome, man. And a great reminder for us all, you know, it's like one of the things that, that Robert Kiyosaki, you know, harps on so much is you got to pay yourself first, you know, yeah. you pay yourself before the IRS, you got to pay yourself before your expenses, all these different things and uh, figure it out after that, right? So the, these are three awesome books. And, and let, I know me Seth, say, let me yeah, just say that, that because I profit first, and I have for years, this type of downturn, short-term downturn in, in the economy doesn't impact me. And that's the key thing about, about how, to, how to live your life. Yeah, it's huge. It's absolutely, yeah. and it's not, it's not selfish, right? I mean, if it's like on the airplane, if the plane is going down, you put the mask on your face first, yeah. then you yeah. can help other people. So that's the whole theory here. Um, I love it. And I just wanted to make a mention real, I got to give a shout out to Seth Godin as well, man. The guy's a genius. If yeah. you're not on his yeah. mailing list, I mean, he sends a blog post every single day. It could be one sentence of four words and it's like so profound. I mean, the yeah. guy is an absolute genius. Yeah. So it's huge. Love it. love it. So talk to me, what's the biggest way that you elevate others or actually let's start with yourself. What's the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? Uh, just, just remaining focused. I, I know this is sounding like contrite and I'm not at going all. Back, but if I lose and I'd like last week was a bad week for me, I lost focus and halfway through the week. I'm like, you know, part of it was Monday. Monday was not effective. And so it really threw screw up, screwed up my whole week. Yeah. This week I said, it's not going to happen. Sunday night, mapped it all out, laid it all out, spelled out what I was going to do and hit the ground running Monday morning and have just nailed it absolutely nailed it and then i go back and using you know michael hyatt's focus planner i can go back and look at every single week for uh the 13 weeks in this in this quarter we have two more to go this week and next and i can tell you man i had some weeks that were home runs I had one that was terrible and all the rest were effective and kept moving me yep. more towards my goals so that is really you know remaining focused and making sure that I do what I'm supposed to be doing that that's how I'm going to have a great year that's yeah. how I'm going to have a great year yeah and it's so interesting how you you create the momentum in whichever direction if you're not focused if you don't start your day with some focus if you don't have a little bit of a routine you're not developing those habits how it can kind of go astray and the same yeah. thing as it goes to starting your week and sort of how that cascades into the rest of your week so that's a great message love yeah. that Talk to me about what's the biggest way that you elevate others around you? Uh, well, uh, that's really my, my owner form program, my consulting program. And let me tell you this, this little story. When I was a New York life agent, right out of college, 22 years old, my manager, who I still know to this day, I, saw, I had dinner with him last week. Uh, he was a very successful agent, left the agent, left the field, came in and, and, and uh, became a manager to help guys like me. And I remember sitting in his office uh, as a 22 year old stupid kid. And I said to him, I said, I said, why, why did you come into management? Why you were doing so well in the field? Why didn't you just stay there? And he goes, Charlie, I love helping you succeed. And I remember hearing that thinking that was the stupidest thing I could ever hear from anybody <laughs> because I'm a dumb, selfish kid. I don't even know what I'm doing that weekend. Now, fast forward 30, 35 years later, and you ask me, why do I do what I do with my students and my clients? Because I love seeing them succeed. I love hearing that they just closed on their first deal. I love that, you know, one of my clients just closed on his third deal this year. I mean, that is so great for me. That tells me I am bringing value to the world uh, when I do that. So, yeah, that's, awesome. that's, that's what I do. Love it, man. You're, you're, you're definitely uh, doing big things and helping so many people. So definitely kudos to you. Any parting thoughts or words of wisdom for Elevate Nation today? Well, I just got to tell you, this is something we didn't talk about before. But, you know, I know, Tyler, you're a CCIM. And I just got to tell uh -oh. people, you know, this is good. I, I, uh, I got to tell you, out of all the times, all the different people who've had the alphabet soup at the end of their name, uh, the only designation that to me has any weight in this business is the CCIM. And you know, I had a, yeah, I had a, uh, a guy come up to me uh, and I said this in, in, when I was speaking in Ohio one time and the guy came up to me afterwards and said, hey, I just wanna tell you, you know, I'm a CCIM, I really appreciate you, you saying that. I said, hey, no, that was, that was true, that was a very heartfelt. Uh, because every, I tell you one time I was, I was doing a deal, uh, I had to sign the contract and, and the broker was a CCIM 
and I had all the document, you know, my, my purchase and sale contract listed all the documents I would need. And as soon as we signed the documents, she just handed over this white binder and everything was right there. And in, in it, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is <laughs> like any other deal I've ever done. And it's all because she's a CCIM. And so let me give everybody a, a tip. Um, now let me just see Tyler, if you know, do you know what the society of exchange counselors is? I do. Absolutely. Oh, Okay. All right. So everybody should go check out secounselors.com. And if you see a property in there that you like, call Tyler because he, you have to work through uh, a CCIM to get the deal done there and give Tyler a call, but go check out secounselors.com. It's a good, good, good website. Yeah. Huge sound, shout out to the Society of Exchange Counselors. You talk about the best of the best in the creative real estate minds, especially yep. at this time, you know, where we've got some massive big shifts happening. How do we get creative? You know, it's been a cash market for the past 10 years, but you know what? There's always a solution and uh, we love the Society of Exchange Counselors. So thanks for that shout out. And yeah. also we got to give more shout outs to the CCIMs out there. You know, these are yeah. folks who are the real deal. Um, they know what's going on. They know how to evaluate a deal. They know how to get it done. They know how to be organized, which is another huge thing that most people are not organized in this business. So appreciate yeah. that shout out. Yeah, and, no, that was cool. Hey, Charlie, this has been an absolute blast. Or really a ton of fun. I really appreciate you spending time. What's the best way for Elevate Nation to, to stay engaged with you? Check out my updated new website at multifamilyinvestingacademy.com. Uh, we were going to have an event, a two-day event in Orlando in May. We have deferred that, we postponed that. Uh, and what we're gonna do is once all the dust settles, we're gonna have a, uh, an Orlando, an LA, and a, a DC, Virginia uh, event uh, announced. Probably in May or June is when we will announce it. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of where we are with, uh, with all of that. So. But uh, yeah, check me out because I got a lot of free stuff on my website. Great. Get on my mailing list. You'll get a vlog from me every Saturday. People love it. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely take a look at his website. He's got a ton of resources there. And if you want to engage further with him, obviously all the information is on that website. We'll put a link in the show notes. And uh, Charlie, I really want to thank you again. And I want to encourage Elevate Nation to re-listen to the show because there's a ton of wisdom here. You know, we're dealing in an unprecedented time. So how do we deal with this? How do we adapt? How do we succeed? And how do we thrive in this environment where most people are just trying to survive? And so at the end of the day, you know, it is all about repetition. It is about sharing as well, because the teacher is who learns the most. Who do you know that needs to know this information? Share this episode with them. You can screenshot it. You can tag myself. You can tag, you know, Charlie, you can tag Elevate Pod, whatever it may be. And, you know, talk to someone else about what we learned today you know, so you can elevate to a life without limits. And so, you know, with that said, Charlie, really thank you again for being here. That was fun, Tyler. Was good. Glad to see you get all dressed up to see me and, uh, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know what? I've got a face for, for the, uh, for the radio here. So the I think radio. Yeah, that's exactly. okay. I never wear pants to these events anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Elevate Nation until next time. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit tylerchesser.com.